it's estimated that the known universe has existed for 13 billion years, when at the beginning of everything, a great explosion called the Big Bang was the initiator of everything known. The universe extends for unthinkable distances in every direction, encompassing millions of stars, worlds and celestial formations, and the billions of cultures that call this part of the universe home. The birth of the galaxy can be traced back to the aggregation of cosmic remnants scattered throughout the universe. A colossal expanse of dust and gas underwent a gravitational collapse, coalescing into a vast disk spanning 100,000 light years in diameter. In the center of the entire galaxy, there is a black hole as the central core, around which everything contained within this galaxy revolves. The galaxy contained approximately 400 billions of stars. Not only this galaxy, our galaxy, was created from this universe material, there are also the dwarf satellite galaxies, some of which have also countless of stars. They are ranked by distance, so the nearest one is formerly called Companion Auric, also known as the Rishi Maze. The other one is Companion Besh, also known as Fire Fist. It's not too far off, galactically speaking, maybe 150,000 light years, but no one has been there save some probots. Also, Companion Besh contained the homeworlds of the Farun, Makavri, Nagai, and Tav species. As is implied, these galaxies receive their name from their proximity to the galaxy, and each receives its name from the Auravesh, which is a writing system commonly used to represent evasive language. So also, the next known galaxies are the Companion Crash, Companion Dawn, Companion Esk, Companion Form, and Companion Greg. These seven galaxies are not the only ones. It's known that there are countless more galaxies, one of them being a very particular one within the universe which we will refer to as the Jusam Vong Galaxy. The Jusam Vong Galaxy is a place where different extragalactic sentient species live, the first of them, the Avominor. The Avominor are believed to be a unique breed of malevolent, self-constructing automata. Possessed with a hunger for power, the Avominor grafted machinery onto their bodies until some even became planet-sized monstrosities. These add-ons were often superfluous or simply non-functional. Some of Aminor experimented with fusing machinery to biological systems, while others build grotesque faces in mockery of the organic enemies they had. The size of these creatures could become so large that even lesser droids lived on them like parasites. Over eons, their appetites became rapacious, and the Avominor exterminated organic species of thousands of planets as they were looking for resources. The Avominor prefer dry environments, as concentrated moisture can quench the internal fires that give them life. Another species that lives within this galaxy are the Chasraj, a reptilian species known as Reptoids. Bred for untold generations as slaves, Chasraj can learn to wield weapons and stay in rough squats. Also, the Chasraj tend to be single-minded and incapable of surrender. Just like the beings that live in the galaxy, which are bipedal and walk on those two legs, and they have made their creations, such as droids, in their likeness, in the Yusan Von galaxy, there existed a group of organic life forms which resembled stars in shape and who designed droids based on that appearance. Unfortunately, these organic creators made their demise when a radiation storm unleashed by a supernova wiped out their existence. Any trace of this civilization was lost in time, leaving only one legacy as a witness to its existence, the Silentium. Despite the destruction of their masters, the droids created in the image of these organic beings endured, continuing the legacy of their creators developing an extragalactic droid society. The droids live on, using manufacturing plants to make children developing a culture center on the prime numbers of 5, 7, and 11. The wisest among them 
build new spherical bodies measuring 50 kilometers in diameter as the circle was considered the holiest of shapes. Others were bodies in the forms of pentagrams or heptagons. A central body plate of polished chromite that will serve as a body, without details or ornaments, save for a single glowing red photoreceptor at the top center. The eye is capable of seeing into ultraviolet and infrared wavelengths. Other sensors and a miniature vocabulator are hidden underneath. Five chromite tentacles serve as arms and legs. These appendages taper to points, then split into five tentacle hands with one small optic sensor in each palm. What most observers fail to notice is that the tips of these fingers continue to split into near microscopic subfingers, able to manipulate the tiniest objects, yet still as strong as Zurasil cables. The silentium could also shoot heat into his extremities and produce a glowing tentacle tip, quite useful for illuminating a room. Without complete certainty, at some point of the extragalactic history, the silentium soon found their kingdom challenged by the Abominor. The two droids fought a war, crushing everything in their path, left in the middle of the crossfire the organic beings of the galaxy. The injustice of a price to be paid by the organic beings because of this robotic war concluded with a rebellion against these two factions, forcing the machines to flee. The organic beings that took up arms in this devastating war were the fourth species of this galaxy, the Yusambong. The Yusambong are bipedal humanoids native to Yusantar. They resemble humans in many ways, but are usually taller, heavier, and have less hair on their heads. Their faces look like lumps of pulsating flesh with droopy eyes underscored by bluish eye sacs. Their foreheads are sloped, giving them a barbaric appearance magnified by their ritual tattooing and self-scarring resulting in grotesque mutilation and reshaping of the features. This type of disfiguration exemplifies a ritualized system symbolic of a path or a journey each Yusan Vong must experience. In order to accomplish a rise in rank, individuals must make one more physical change to recreate themselves in the shape of one of their gods. They sacrifice a body part, an organ or a limb, to bring themselves closer to perfection and thereby closer to their gods. They then graft other parts onto themselves, limbs from another creature. The Yusan Vong never seem to maim themselves in any way that might hinder their ability to function, but only in ways that change their appearance or improve their abilities. Warriors especially are given the opportunity to replace sacrificed limbs with the limbs from the bodies of their defeated foes or with parts from particularly vicious predators perhaps a sharp claw. Those whose changing ceremony has failed and who are functionally maimed are demoted to the lowest ranks of the lowest caste, mere workers or shamed ones. Everything these people do is for the greater glory of their gods as they follow their path of conquering and dominating the galaxy. Yusan Vong warriors will not surrender to an enemy under any circumstances for fear of insulting their gods. They use bioengineered weapons, tools and ships to further their cause, and they find the use of the actual machinery extraordinarily offensive. They refer to those not of the Yusan Vong as infidels and take perverse pleasure in their own pain and in the pain of the others. An attack on their pride is cause for a death duel, which also can be considered a sacrifice to their gods. To die in battle is among the highest honors they can achieve. Religion within the Yusanbon culture is one of the most important things. The true way is the name of this religion, and the adjectives that can describe it are violent, intolerant, and doctrinally. Part of the life and ideology revolves around the religion. The Yusun Vong believe their gods are entities that watch their every move. 
The gods can be plagued or encouraged to give their power to support an individual's goals through prayer and personal sacrifice. The gods commonly demand blood sacrifices that are used on bone performed with fanatical devotion. As said before, they are horrified and disgusted by their technological societies, and this emphasis on biotechnology extends into their religious beliefs and their history. The Yusan Vaughan consider the non-living architecture of the galactic societies blasphemous, non-living machines monstrous, and droids particularly offensive because of their sacrilegious imitation of life. In fact, the Yusan Vaughan consider it a grievous insult to describe their tools and equipment as biotechnology. Given the twisted technological culture that infects the worlds the gods have promised them, most Jews and Vong believe without question that it's their holy duty to destroy the infidels. Many see the destruction of these creatures a manifestation of the great doctrine. Each Jews and Vong is expected to honor the gods in all things, particularly by striving to advance within his caste and remake himself in the shape of his gods. Much sacrifice and penance is involved because the Creator sacrificed pieces of Himself to construct the entire universe. The Creator survived great pain, culminating in a death leading to high exaltation to create the lesser gods, who in turn piece the Jews and Bong together by mixing and matching parts from other creatures. Thus, sacrifice is sacred when required. Death is inevitable, but how one dies is all important. The greatest glory a Jusan Von warrior can claim is to die while purging promised worlds of foul creatures dependent on dead machines. The Jusan Vong portray their gods in a range of statuary, paintings, and other artwork. They believe their gods are physical beings, although they exist on a plane that beings in this reality can fully understand. These deities consider the beginning of all that exists. The Creator is not completely absent from Yu Sanbong life. However, rites and sacrifices devoted to Jun Yu San are conducted on the most holy of days. The most direct appeals to Jun Yu San require death sacrifices. According to legend, the Creator sacrificed his body parts to form the universe, the lesser gods, and the Yu Sanbong. In honor he sacrifices, the Jusan Vong in turn sacrifice body parts and living beings in remembrance of his act of creation. Furthermore, according to the Jusan Vong beliefs, the Creator God contained all the knowledge of the universe which he kept to himself. However, he was robbed of some of this information by Jun Harla, who in turn provided it to Jun Neshel and she gave it to the Jusan Vong. Thus, the Yu San Vong believed that the knowledge was incapable of being created and that innovation was considered heresy. And there, another reason for the total hatred of technological innovation by the Yu San Vong. The Yu San Vong were named for him, and they never abbreviates the name of the species by the Vong, offends the Creator God and is a blasphemy of the highest order. Every so often, the Creator chooses to communicate with the Supreme Overlord, the highest ranking member of the Yu San Vong society. Only the Supreme Overlord of the Yu San Vong could address him, and he or she was ritually scarred and modified to resemble Jun Yu San. The God of Carnage, Jun Yamka is one of the most important figures in the Yu San Vong pantheon and makes up one of the two twin gods with Jun Harla. Together, they promoted victory in battle over their enemies of the Yu San Vong. Jun Jamka is considered the patron of the warlords and honored by every Yu San Vong warrior, he demands unfailing devotion in the art of war from his followers. Any appeal, other than the standard mourning and evening prayers, must be presented with a death sacrifice. Jun Jamka appears as a bulbous headed tentacle creature that resembles a cross between an octopus and a jellyfish. Some philosophers hold that the Slayer sometimes works at cross purposes with the Jusan Vong. Thanks to Jun Jamka, 
deicidic devastation as a necessary part of the species' steady advancement toward godhood. June Harla is the trickster goddess of the Yusumpan pantheon. She is portrayed in statuary and art as a slender female whose form is mostly hidden by a voluminous cloak. Her face is always hidden in shadows. Her body is said to be composed entirely of borrowed parts. The only fact the sources agree upon is that her skeleton is made from jodic coral. The cloaked goddess is the patron of the secrets, hidden things in those who make lies and deception a major part of their lives, such as spies, undercover operatives, and con artists. She is also the entity who watches over sacred changing rituals. Even the most honest and forthright Jusen Vong appeals to Jun Harla on the eve before undergoing a change. Appeals to her occasionally involve a price, but not death sacrifices. Instead, petitioner must loudly pronounce one or more of their deepest, darkest secrets before her image, or must perform a shape-changing ritual on an animal or a captured alien. Jun Harla is often honored alongside Jun Jamka, the Slayer, as said before. The festival of the Twin Gods is a holiday among the Yus and Bong in honor of the Slayer and the Trickster. The holiday is marked by a dropping of rules among the Yus and Bong, where they can play practical jokes on their elders and superiors without fear of consequence. A more low-key practice of this day is the traditional exchange of secrets between friends and even between enemies. This hermaphroditic entity is considered the one who oversees the gentler aspects of the Yusambon life. Jin initially is credited in most tales with conceiving the basic appearance and life cycles of all living beings. The modeler had hoped to build a peaceful paradise with the tools provided by the Creator, but intervention by the Twin Gods brought pain suffering and treachery into existence. Most Jus and Von myths cast Jun Jamka and Jun Harla as heroic visionaries and portray Jun Neshel as an idealistic fool who will have inadvertently denied the Jus and Vong the drive needed to ascend to godhood. Even priests of Jun Neshel are hard pressed to disagree with this belief. If the galaxy have been the peaceful place the mother envisioned, motivation to seek the perfection of the gods wouldn't have existed. Jun Neshel governs creative pursuits ranging from art and architecture to innovate ideas in weapons design. Also, is the goddess of childbirth. Statuary and art always portray the mother with infants, gentle animals, farming implements, or the tools of an artisan. Virtually, every female who becomes pregnant in Yu and Wong society appeals to the mother to ensure a safe pregnancy and a healthy child. As is fitting for Jun Neshel's personality, the deity requires no sacrifice from petitioners. Jun Shino holds both the narrowest and broadest sphere of influence among the Yu and Wong gods. She is the source of hope honored by the hopeless. She is the thousand-night patron duty of the shamed ones. The shamed ones are those whose body has rejected living implants or creatures used in rituals. They have either died or become ill or deformed in some way that is inconsistent with expected results. It's believed that the failed transformation rituals either wreck results of a Jusun Von having committed some offense that has earned him the disfavor of one of the twin gods or the mother. For doomed souls who seem to have been condemned groundly, Jun Shun is the only being to whom they can pray for release and forgiveness in this life or the afterlife. The partner can intercede with the mother and the creator to improve the lot of these shamed ones but only if they are deserving. These gods are always worshipped together, young people seeking to ensnare the hearts of those they desire honor them, as do older individuals seeking help with an already established relationship. 
as their sobriquet implies. They are the patrons of love, intimacy, and close personal relationships. The lovers are portrayed as enemies of the twin gods, but they are considered close allies of Juneshil. The lovers are never directly portrayed in art, but are instead represented by iconography in sensual and erotic art, implying that they either inspire the artist or the subjects featuring the piece. The lovers are viewed as capricious gods who visit their attention upon whatever things they wish. While supplicants can attempt to attract or divert their attention, there is very little mortals can do. They don't require active worship or sacrifices, although they have inspired a great numbers of holy days. This god is the lowest in the religion, but rarely feared. The Jews and von Castes were the social groupings that the Jews and von belonged to, while the special actions could cause them to be promoted to another caste. Failures will usually result in demotion to another. The most powerful and the smallest caste in Yusan Vong society is Supreme Overlord. The ruling overlord is the religious and secular authority in Yusan Vong culture. He is considered the only one out of all the Yusan Vong who has the ear of the Creator. In ages past, the title was strictly a hereditary one which is Supreme Overlord appointed an heir from among his or her offspring upon ascending to the position. A childless Supreme Overlord will take obliged to adopt a person who will take his or her place. Such heirs were always drawn from the shaper or warrior caste due to both tradition and political reality. In modern Yusenbon culture, the Supreme Overlord rules by maintaining the goodwill of high-ranking shapers, priests, and the support of the warrior caste at large. While the title and authority can still be passed from a parent to a child, it's quite acknowledged but rarely stated that a figure of the senior priests and shapers determine the true line of succession. The caste responsible for creating all things used by the Yusan Vong. This class in Yusan Vong society is considered the equivalent of bioengineers and scientists. So, here are the scientists, biologists, and bioengineers who create and maintain the living machines and tools that power the Yusan Vong society. Shapers are also trained to facilitate delicate rituals in conjunction with priests. Shapers are born into the caste, but to maintain their social status, they must successfully complete rigorous educational programs in painful shaping and scaring rituals. They must additionally pass increasingly challenging aptitude and intelligence tests. If they fail at any step along the way, they are forced into another caste usually becoming intendants or workers. Rare individuals who are particularly adept both as scholars and soldiers might find a place in the warrior caste, and particularly devoted followers of a god might end up going into the priest's caste. The shapers are second only to members of the supreme overlord caste in social status. Higher-ranking master shapers hold nearly as much power as those in the higher caste. Their caste is also viewed as having the purpose closest to that of the Creator Himself. The most inexperienced or incapable shapers are known as savants. The priests are the only beings outside the Supreme Overlord caste set to communicate directly with the gods. With exception of the Creator, each of the Yusan Vong deities has organized cults devoted to his or her worship. Each cult is founded by donations from worshippers or payments gathered by the priest for services rendered. For example, priests of the modeler often assist in childbirth, while priests of the clothed goddess are often hired by other Yusan Vong to serve as spies and private investigators. 
The more popular the faith, the larger and more elaborate their temples and the more power priests wield in society. Individuals born into the priest caste who don't show appropriate devotion or who are otherwise deemed unfit to serve the gods are demoted to the intendant caste. At a young age, those who remain in the priest caste are sent to study the sacred texts of the Yusunfang, and at the age of 16, each priest undergoes a grueling ceremony during which he receives visions from the god or goddess who has chosen him as a servant. Savants are the lowliest of the Yusunfang priests, the first step in the order. They work in the temples as assistants to more experienced priests. They are eventually promoted to the rank of seer after receiving an accurate prophetic vision from the god they serve. Some priests might spend years as a savant, while others receive their vision within mere weeks. Seers make up the bulk of the Yusanvon clergy. They act as intermediaries between the gods and the common people, and they occasionally assist shapers with transformation rites when no priests are available. They almost always play a role in assisting high-ranking individuals in preparing themselves for transformations. When overseeing transformations, seers are often supposed to let each person preparing for the ritual decide whether the gods will offer support. If a seer is incorrect and a petitioner ends up as one of the shamed ones, the seer's life usually ends as a sacrifice to Junjamka, the slayer. Finally, Seers are expected to help the priest during services and on holidays. Most seers spend their entire time in the clergy at this level. A select few who are judged particularly devout and who receive multiple verifiably accurate visions from the gods become ordained, elevated to full priestly status. These castes have among the responsibilities the policing of their own ranks corruption and dishonesty are not tolerated, although dishonesty is a fluid term for those who serve the clothed goddess. Those judged wanting are often used as sacrifices on high holy days. Priests are considered the executors of divine will on this level of existence. The priest, like seer, receives visions and instructions from the gods, but unlike the lower-ranking members of the holy orders, the priests have the authority and the cloud to act on these visions. Within this rank of the priest castes are two distinctly different factions. One heads up congregations of worshippers and ministers local religious practices on subdued worlds. The other goes into battle along with members of the warrior caste. High priests not only serve as the political and spiritual leader of the various cults, but also as the chief advisor and assistant to the supreme overlord and the highest ranking war masters. They are among the most powerful individuals in the Yu Sanvong society. While seers must interpret the visions they receive, high priests often receive visits from the gods directly, deep within the most holy chambers of the temples. As such, high priests can serve as final referee of veracity when seers and lower-ranking priests make controversial claims. The warrior caste is one of the largest of the Yusunvong, and it's believed by many to be the most favored of the gods. Warriors are the ones who are in charge with actually making it possible for the rest of the Yusanvong society to continue its ascent toward the divine. Warriors are the frontline troops, the men and women who charge into battle against alien species whose wars are to be subjugated, reshaped, and purged of the taint of the unliving devices of which infidels seem so fond. Subalterns command units as small as 12 warriors and as large as 300, with unit members ranging from spies and other specialists to standard infantry troops. Warriors follow orders to the death. Within the structure of the military, many commanders don't have specific troops to answer to them. These commanders often head into an enemy territory before a Jusenvog offensive to serve as saboteurs, spies, and propagandists. 
these agents provocateur work to undermine the government and social structure of the species targeted for conquest. The commanders report to a supreme commander, who in turn answers to a war master. War masters are at the top of the warrior caste. These figures answer only to supreme overlord and the high priests. They are responsible for the overall coordination of campaigns, the allocation of resources to various branches of the military, and the smooth transition of subjugated wars from the hands of conquered species to the use and bunk. War masters ensure that just the right amount of force is present on a planet to keep the population subdued and facilitate the establishment of various environmental changes needed to grow use and bone biotech. The members of this caste are responsible for keeping commerce and trade operating within the Yu Sanvong society. Its members also supervise the slave population, making sure there are enough slaves in places where they are needed and that they are cared for properly. Intendants work closely with the priests to keep the political and bureaucratic aspects of the Yu Sanvong culture operating with a minimal amount of bloodletting and violence. The lowest ranking intendants are known as executors. Their ranks are filled with failed priests and warriors, as well as those born into the caste and those elevated from the worker caste. The latter are mostly diligent young Jews and Vong, looking to advance themselves even further within the intendant caste. While they rarely have expensive responsibilities, they take great care to perform their duties flawlessly making sure that whatever slaves they manage are healthy. Failed priests and warriors have been condemned, as most of them view it, to a life of time-wasting details. When an intendant has proven to be a capable administrator, he or she is promoted to the rank of consul. At this rank, he or she is usually in charge of a particular part of a warship's operation or the supply trains going to and from specific bases. Prefects are expected to make sure that consuls perform their duties properly. Any shortfall in supplies is considered the personal responsibility of a prefect in charge of a particular resource. Prefects are also expected to create infrastructures where none may have existed before, such as when the supreme overlord brings a revelation from the gods that a new technology must be produced. High prefects are responsible for predicting the future needs of Yu Sanvong society. They administer the overall direction of commerce, manufacturing, and slavery services. High prefects have been among the secret movers and shakers in Yu Sanvong society for centuries, and their subtle manipulations have led to the weakening of the boundaries between castes. This is the lowest and most populous caste in Yu Sanvong society. This caste consists of three types of workers, those who have failed to succeed in any other caste and who have been forced into this one, those who are born into it but fail to gain a warrior or priest patron who can seize their rise to a higher caste, and the members of the conqueror species. Slaves and the Shenwons are technically considered part of the worker caste, but others' workers shun them, often scorn upon those unfortunate. Workers and slaves perform all sorts of occupations, from garbage collector to personal attendant. The Yu Sanvong employ many effective weapons. The particularity in what is surprising is the fact that none of them are mechanical. Each is a living organism, bred to a specific function. Magma pebbles are non-organic thrown weapons, consisting of a shell filled with a thumbnail-sized glove of magma. The pebbles are primarily used to counter the battle droids that they use among warriors encounter while fighting. As the magma contained within, could heavily damage the circuits and armor of droids. Only high-ranking Yu Sun Vong possess these sinister symbionts, which closely resemble Yu Sun Vong ice balls. 
It was a creature capable of spitting deadly poison and used by the Yusan Vong as a weapon, most commonly replacing an eyeball in its socket. It could be used accurately at a distance of about 10 meters. The weapon was activated with a simple movement of the user's eyelid. Bioengineer grenades carried by Yu Sun Vong strike teams. Like the Amphistaff, a plasma eel was long and flexible enough, allowing it to coil around its user's waist when not in use. When uncoiled and thrown, the eel became rigid like a spear and its head glowed with growing plasma energy. In flight, a plasma eel vented excess energy through its tail, adding additional thrust. Upon impact, the plasma will explode with the force of a thermal detonator. A bioengineered weapon with extremely sharp edge, resembling a fist-sized disc-shaped insect. The razor box had carapaces that were capable of shredding flesh and piercing certain types of armor. When thrown, it will deploy its wings which held guided towards the target, giving it a homing capabilities. Blast box are projectile vials used as a guided missile. Upon reaching contact with the target, the blast box will explode sending the victim hurling through the air, causing severe burns and even breaching armor. A beetle with sharp, jagged legs. Its wings are very powerful, emitting a loud buzzing sound when active and causing a distinctive thud when striking an object. A thud box maximum velocity could exceed almost 100 miles per hour, knocking an opponent to the ground or breaking limbs. Thought box could also be used in such a way so as to stun or disorient targets, making them easy prey for capture. Snap box are projectile causing an explosion with the characteristics of a bright flash and a sonic boom. It will temporarily blind or deafen enemies. An amphistaff is a serpentine creature that can become rigid as a stone and is generally employed as a quarter staff. The creature can contract the muscles around its head and tail, forming razor sharp edges, becoming a two headed spear. Properly stimulated, the amphistaff can relax its body and act as a whip or speed venom up to 20 meters away. It can also deliver poison with its bite. A living creature, bioengineered by the Yu Sun Vong to serve as a weapon. The amorphous jelly was carried by a warrior in a specially designed bag. In battle, the jelly was hurled at an enemy, usually in the direction of a foe's feet, at which point the jelly expanded. It's able to wrap itself around an enemy's foot. As it moved, the jelly began to devour the victim's flesh, causing hideous injuries even if escape was possible. In some cases, the Yu Sun Vong warrior wouldn't even have to enter the fight. The Vlora's jelly could kill an enemy if it was not removed quickly. A slightly curved double-edged dagger used by the Yu Sun Vong in close quarters combat. The daggers were approximately 20 centimeters long and like all use of Vong technology, fully organic and alive. These weapons were often used as a last resort and a first choice of sacrifice for honor-driven warriors. Members of the same predatory serpentine species as the larger Amphistaff, shorter than its Amphistaff cousin, the Tsaisi was a delicate and precise weapon that required specialized training to be used effectively. Because of the special training and immense skill needed to properly wield it, they were reserved only for elite warriors and when not in use were worn around the arm as a symbol of rank. Like the weaponry of the Yu Sun Vong, their equipment is also a form of living creatures, specially bred by the Shaper caste. The Yu Sun Vong breed von Doom crabs especially to provide armor for their warriors. This protective covering is consisting by layer plates of living armor shifted just to the muscles of their host, 
breathing and pulsing response to unspoken commands. Spiky growths protruded from the user's knees, elbows, wrists, and neck, growing as the armor ages. The more developed the Von Doom craft, the longer the spikes and the better the armor. The best suits of living armor are provided to the use of Vong military leadership commanders and those of higher rank. One type of armor employed by the Yu Vong are the glista web, that is a robe of shimmering cloth. While it provides not benefit against physical attacks, its energy dampening properties make it almost as effective against blaster bolts as Von Doomcraft armor. This material is provided almost solely to the highest ranking members of each caste or occasionally to Yu Vong acting as ambassadors in unfriendly territory. Chillaps are minuscule, group-like creatures that the Yu Vong use as cover recording media. While in the nasal cavity, a chillap can observe events via the user's eyes and ears, creating a visual and auditory record that can later be uploaded into a Khan Casa, a biological memory storage device. An organic breathing filter this creature allows the Yusun Vong to breathe in any non-corrosive gaseous or liquid environment. Shaped like a starfish with a long, central proboscis, this creature is worn over the mouth and nose, allowing it to insert its proboscis down its user's throat. The process is extremely uncomfortable. A biotechnological suit that when adhered to the user's body begins to spread throughout the entire body area, inserting thousands of tiny grappling tendrils directly into the pores, leaving a clear area around the head to facilitate vision. Likewise, when using it, the process is extremely painful. Related to the Oculith Cloaker, this creature allows the user to cover his or her entire body with a convincing disguise. Generally, only Yu Sun Vong involved in deep cover operations employ them. Small brown worms by engineers that act as translators between their language and those used by other species. Despite their size, these creatures were able to store vast quantities of information and transmit to the user subliminally. They were used by inserting the worm into an ear where it will burrow in and transmit information through vibrations. Once in place, it allowed the user to both understand and speak in other language. It could only be used for a limited time, and if left in too long, will grow exhausted and vibrate itself to death. The primary method of communication amongst the use of Vong. Informally, it could be understood as the use of Vongola projector. Created in pairs, these leathery lumps of flesh maintain contact with each other over even galactic distances. The use of Vong use Vilips to communicate across these long distances in the fashion they call Vilip speech. The user awakens a Vilip by stroking it after which it stimulates its twin to awaken as well regardless of where or how far away the twin is. Each billy then unfolds along the soul break in its membranous outer tissue and puckers its flesh into the shape of the owner of the billy at the other end. In effect, the billy shows its operator the features of the person he or she is communicating with. In addition, the billy emulates the voice of the other party completing the illusion of speaking to the other person. Yu Sun Vong used Vilips in a variety of ways. Military commanders frequently wear multiple Vilips mounted on their shoulders as they enter ground battle, or employ multiple Vilips to create three-dimensional images of space battles. Vilips can also be implanted in missiles and fire at ships. The missile burns through the hull, leaving the Vilip unharmed and therefore able to establish communications with the ship. 
These creatures were capable of storing knowledge, thus serving as living memory banks, a style of computers. They came in a variety of sizes, from personal devices to databases for warships. It's possible to place a lock on the living device that will be coded genetically, and it can only be opened with an incredibly complex biochemical key. The ships of the Yusun Vong, indeed, most of their structures, are made of a kind of strong coral material of a variety of chemical compositions and physical configurations. The primary construction method through which the Yusun Vong made their living vessels is through the use of geotic coral. This type of coral is what forms the essential basis of the entire ship infrastructure of this society. It should be taken into account that the geotic coral can age like any biological organism, so some ships may die. The production of spaceships is through the cultivation of ship-shaped coral within the planet Yusantar. After cultivating and developing it, symbiotic creatures will be implanted or grown inside to subsequently perform the function of a ship. It will absorb the material it was grown on like rock, or refined ores, or occasionally, wreckage of enemy bunkers of buildings, but also required organic material. In a completed ship, the Jody Coral possessed the nervous system that controlled and coordinated the various vials, as well as a circulatory system that sustained them. Thus, if the Jody Coral of a ship sustained enough damage, it will cut off control and sustenance to all of the various subsystems, resulting in loss of efficiency and then total failure. This coral-type substance formed the whole and internal anatomy of their vessels. While several other races had mastered bioengineering, the Yusan Vong were one of the few that had developed a mass production means of creating such organisms. The Yusan Vong were capable of farming in such a rapid time that they matched the mass production of the Republic's large interstellar ships, for example. The outer skin of such craft, despite being alive, didn't feel anything in the vacuum of space as the nerves were exposed to the call of the void. They were created to lack any nerve endings at such locations. Although the outer hull didn't possess any nerve endings, the inner hull did and any breach led to alarms being raised, thus alerting the use and vong of intruders. In terms of tools necessary to pilot a ship, the use and vong had the taljur, more commonly known as cognition hoods. These were the interfaces that the use and vong used to interact with and pilot their ships. Cognition hoods were in separate organisms but actually a part of the vessels they were shaped into. But actually a part of the vessels they were shaped into and connected to their pilots through neural cusps. The hoods also respond to actions and physical movements that only the Yu and Vong themselves could perform. The cognition hoods not only helped the pilot control the ship better, but also was a speaker to help the pilots talk to each other. The cognition hoods will store some of the moves the pilot made and will help them plot exact procedures and precise attacks. At the heart of the Yusun Vong invasion fleet are massive living warships made of entirely of Jody coral, known as Korostron. Each vessel is more than 6 miles in diameter and houses 5,000 warriors plus several thousand civilians and slaves. A warship carries hundreds of coral skippers, Yusun Vong short-range fighters, and a number of other craft and vessels. Behind each warship, log tendrils pull tethered pilot coral skippers. When warships travel between galaxies, a number of Yusun Vong capital scale ships are also tethered to each one. These vessels serve as homes to thousands of warriors. A warship is a transport, battleship, and a psychological weapon all in one. 
While there are formidable warships, they are constructed primarily as colony vessels. They are specifically built to facilitate a trip from one galaxy to the next. These creatures provide propulsion for most use of bomb vehicles by creating pulses. Warships can fan their trailing tendrils into sails to catch interstellar energy winds when there are no nearby gravity fields. The fighter craft of the Yusan Vong fleet is the Coral Skipper, called by the Yusan Vong as Jody Ket, an asteroid like single pilot ship grown from organic Jodic coral and armed with a plasma firing volcano cannon. Coral Skippers fight in squadrons of six, with six squadrons to a wing. A very particular organic tool used by the Yusan Vong. These spherical plants serve the same function as the reposal lift engines, sublight engines, tractor beams, and deflector shield projectors on a conventional ship, but transported for the organic technology of the Yusan Vong. The Dovin vessel provides lift, propulsion, control, and damage ablation all through the manipulation of the gravitational field surrounding the ship. They were capable of creating micro black holes that could absorb laser shots at the spacecraft, as well as almost anything else, from proton torpedoes to concussion missiles. The Tsikvai is an organic atmospheric vehicle used by the Yusan Vong as a search craft. The Tsikvai resembled a manta ray with an egg sac for signaling to other craft in the area. This neck sack inflated and turned bright red as a signal to other Tsikvai, with flexible wings and gill analogs that made it made a particular sound in flight. These gills functioned as intake valves. The Tsikvai also have several long tentacles for grabbing prisoners. It's not known for certain but Yusan Vong history speculates that it was during the conflict between the Vominor and the Silentium when the Yusan Vong learned to use their resources within their planet Yusantar because of a war between machines that was taking society of innocent Yusan Vong by surprise. According to legend, the Yusan Vong asked their gods for help in countering their enemies, giving them the knowledge they need to convert their living resources into weapons eventually defeating the droid enemies. Having eradicated the threat and strengthened by their great victory, the Yusan Vong gradually became conquerors of other species and civilizations. The Yusan Vong went on a crusade to cleanse their galaxy of all forms of mechanical technology. They conquered much of their galaxy and either exterminated or enslaved conquered species. Among those species they conquered, were the reptile Chasraj, who became slate soldiers for the use of Vong. Their galaxy witnessed a new conquering power that devastated war after war in its wake. As expected, a violent and extremist community like the Yu San Vong weren't always going to be on the good terms. In addition, the lack of social and military organization due to the early stage that the Yusan Vong species were living was the reason why the total army unit was divided into the so-called domains. A type of clans or families that were limited to a single caste. The vast majority of the time, what in the future will be understood as the warrior caste, was a predominant one within the domains and the role of leader was taken by a war master. The rivalries between domains were always intense, reaching their peak in the so-called Kremlevian War. The battle that will go down in history as the most epic confrontation in Yusan Vong Chronicles. At that time, the two most powerful and important domains were those under the leadership of War Master Jogand and War Master Sten. Both factions, in their different conquests throughout their galaxy, were ruthless and barbaric, but the war that the two had for absolute control and power was even greater, 
with the total destruction of different planets, even their galaxy. Ixir, in the Yuson Von galaxy, was the central planet and headquarters of the domain Stank, and it was until Jogand faced with the rival domain of this planet, who were heavily entrenched in possessing resources to resist a frontal assault, decided to try a new approach to vanquishing their opponents. So, Jogan's strategy was the use of the Dovin Basil. As said before, the Dovin Basil is an organic thing used as a tool of both defense and travel. In this particular case, this creature will be useful to be able to generate gravitational fields with such strength capable of even taking ships out of the hyperspace. Jogand infiltrated the Dovin Vasal on the surface of Ixir. The Dovin Vasal subsequently tasked with focusing the planet's gravitational field onto a moon of the planet. Once the moon had been snared by the creature's effect, it was dragged down toward Ixir, directly impacting the planet. The resulting impact destroyed Ixir, wiping out all of Jogan's enemies on the planet except Stank, whom Jogan defeated in single combat. Due to the nature of the tactic and the Dovin Basal's anchorage to the target planet's core, this war movement it became known as Jogan's core. The end of the Kremlevian War resulted in the unification of the Yusan Bank under the command of Jogan, thus becoming the first supreme overlord of the Yusan Bank. Jogan entered into a legend as a skilled and redoubtable warrior. Such was Jogan's reputation that the eyes of Jun Harla, the goddess of trickery, were said to be the only remaining parts of Jogan. In the minds of Yusun Von warriors, Jogand represented a pinnacle of martial prowess and achievement. Upon being named Supreme Overlord, it was agreed that all overlords will wear ceremonial robes, with the particularity that these will be made from the skin torn from Steng's body after his defeat during the Kremlevian War. This, it was worn by Jogand in every successive Supreme Overlord. Not everything was correct with Jogan's tactic. Due to the gravitational disturbances wrought by the destruction of planets, as well as the radiation that could sometimes be spread, the tactic could render whole systems inaccessible or uninhabitable. The destruction of their galaxy and their homeworld, Yusantar, forced the Yusan Vong into the intergalactic void, where they will wander for millennia until they can find a new home, a new galaxy. <laughs>